useful. And um, as I say, we, we eventually made, uh, I think, 12 of these up. And one of the uh, friends who helped me to, uh, to do these, uh, Chris G4CYA, um, he ran eight of them at one stage as a, as a, a huge uh, uh, tropo array. And he, he could work things into the far side of Germany and beyond when the band seemed absolutely flat. So you can have a pass that round. You can't hurt it anymore because it's, uh, it's defunct, that one. Um, <laughs> You can get lots of information, by the way. Um, I've, I mean, I've just brought a selection of three books. Um, all of these have got information uh, uh, as to how to make and construct various Yagi antennas and dish antennas. Um, and I would recommend that if you're serious about uh, uh, wanting to make uh, some antennas, you know, get yourself something like this, or you can go on the internet to, uh, to actually access information. But the microwave handbook's got lots of useful information. Uh, this one, um, UHF microwave projects, it's got some stuff on um, loop yagis in there. Uh, loop yagis, I think the, the guy who really started them off, J3 uh, JVL, um, that's all in this uh, microwave handbook. Um, so you, you can find information there. Uh, perhaps the easiest way of, um, of, of perhaps uh, feeding your microwave uh, Yagi, uh, and here we're perhaps thinking about 23 centimetres or 13 centimetres perhaps, uh, I would say is, is to use something called a folded dipole. Now when you fold a dipole, uh, it changes the feed impedance from uh, 50 ohms up to uh, 200 ohms. So um, uh, you have to go from coax, which is... Uh, uh, an unbalanced form of transmission line to a balance, uh, and you have to change the feed impedance uh, from 50 ohms up to, uh, uh, up to uh, 200 ohms. And it's actually relatively easy to do that, and I'll show you in a second uh, how that's done. Uh, antenna splitters, so if you wanted to stack antennas, those are relatively easy to make. Um, uh, basically, it just involves um, either a square or circular um, uh, section uh, with a, another piece inside it and basically you make up your own coaxial uh, um, uh, section uh, and if you use the right dimensions you can get 50 ohms and you can split, uh, split the signal up and uh, feed number of antennas like that and again there's lots of design information for those. Uh, we've also mentioned it's quite advantageous to mount your power amplifiers and receive pre-amplifiers at the mast head. Uh, that's to cut down on uh, um, transmission cable losses. Here is a, is a practical feed then. Um, um, let's, I said it was the practical, uh, uh, I was interested in the practical side of things. There, there are lots of possibilities, if you like, for feeding uh, uh, Yagis. Um, but one thing, by the time we are getting to microwave frequencies, uh, it is beginning to get quite, um, quite critical. Um, Yagi type antennas are essentially narrow bands um, and, and if you get the dimensions wrong uh, it's, you're possibly going to end up outside the desired uh, 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 section of uh, band that you want to work with. Um, this arrangement here, uh, this is a homemade antenna, it's, made, it's actually, I can pass it round, uh, it's made out of a, an old TV antenna. Um, this one's not mine, um, it belongs to uh, uh, M0GAV. Uh, I can't remember who made it, Andy, do you know? I can't remember, I tried that somewhere. Yeah, but this is a typical example of what you might be able to do. And again, if you think um, virtually no cost involved here, you can't really uh, go very far wrong. It's an old TV uh, antenna. Even if you had to buy this, it would only probably be £15. And the, the real bit is this bit at the top here. And this is a folded dipole. Uh, it's an N-type connector. And then this little section here which is made out of semi-rigid uh, um, uh, coax cable, something that we use a lot at microwave frequencies. Uh, that is doing the change from uh, unbalanced uh, to balanced uh, feed, and it steps the impedance up from, uh, uh, from 50 ohms up to the 200 ohms. So a very cheap antenna, and that does work. Uh, both Andy and myself have used it, and it's quite an effective antenna. Um, it's the elements are tapered, so uh, uh, and they're, they're set at a set distance. Um, we don't know quite, I'm not sure which um, design criteria that they use to do this, uh, but it'll be quite interesting tomorrow. We'll stick that on the uh, antenna test range. And, well, it can't get much cheaper than that, can it, really? So there's no excuse uh, 
um, for not having an antenna, I suppose. So pass that round and have a look at the feed arrangement. So uh, while that's going round, we'll, we'll have a look at a few more. Um, yeah, somebody was, uh, I, was I can't remember who I was talking to, it might have been Bernie, and we're saying how, how useful it is to be able to get uh, bits and pieces uh, from, uh, from some of the local hardware stores. And certainly, uh, I sort of frequent, uh, I shouldn't say this, I suppose, on air, at uh, B&Q, um, one of my local hardware stores, and they have some great bits and pieces uh, to help you manufacture antennas. And one of the things that um, I picked up fairly recently is a set of um, digital calipers. So if you need to measure elements uh, and get them exact, they were selling, I can't remember if it was uh, B&Q or Macklin's, were selling these digi digital uh, calipers off, and that, uh, they were ridiculous. It was something like 12 or 14 pounds, not too expensive, and with those you can measure to within fractions of a millimetre. Um, so some, some useful bits like that. Um, these sort of things, uh, pipe clips, uh, they make really effective standoff insulators. So uh, this antenna that I've got here, um, that's a well, it's a very old commercial antenna. Uh, this is a, um, a tonner antenna. And if you notice the, um, uh, the dipole, um, well, it's been replaced. There's no dipole there. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but the actual uh, uh, director elements are stood on these uh, spaces. So uh, once you do that, you get away from the effects of the boom uh, because if you put elements uh, like that which is mounted on the boom or like the, um, the little uh, Yagi that um, was actually for 70 sems that went through the boom you have to sort of uh, apply correction factors um, uh, because of the effect that the boom has when you do this you can more or less um, you, you avoid these problems of the, uh, the effects of the boom um, this antenna had been up in the air for about um, uh, 25 years, I think. It's a very old antenna. Um, unfortunately, the, the chap who had it has, has died, very sadly, uh, G0RRJ. Um, but I, I bought that antenna, um, and I've sort of repaired it, and it's all been sprayed, and that's ready to go back up in the air. This is actually for 13 centimetres. Um, so, um, 13 centimetres. The interesting bit about this is the actual feed arrangement. And um, people were mentioning about it's starting to get quite critical uh, with dimensions when it comes to making a folded dipole. Um, well, this makes it a lot easier. Basically, this box at the back here, and it is just a box, um, it's a piece of waveguide. Uh, waveguide uh, to suit 13 centimetre frequency. Um, and I'll pass it round, and you see it's absolutely ridiculously easy to make. And the good thing is, uh, it presents quite a nice match um, to, uh, um, to the band. So uh, there's no complicated matching arrangement here. So we've got a, a waveguide launcher and then a Yagi. So it's a bit like a hybrid uh, antenna. And I think if any of you are interested in, um, say, 13 centimetres or possibly 9 centimetres, and you still want to use some kind of Yagi antenna, by using a waveguide launcher like this, followed by some uh, uh, Yagi type directors, uh, you'll be able to make yourself quite an effective antenna uh, without any complicated matching things. I'll pass that round. Uh. How susceptible to weather is that one? Um, obviously, if you've got a lot of water standing in the waveguide, it would, it would affect it. Um, I've not really tried it. Uh, I know Dave Cox, who, who was the guy who used to own this antenna, it was out in all weathers, and uh, I, mean, I, I had to clean it because it, it was going really, you know, it had been up for 25 years. <laughs> um, but as far as I know, it didn't cause a huge amount of problems. Uh, if you notice, there's actually drain holes in the waveguide. Um, so, um, I, I mean, it's sheltered. The, the actual probe inside is just a little piece of uh, um, copper plate. Uh, well, I mean, we'll see. Um, but that, that's actually got quite a good amount of gain. That's, uh, I think it was quoted as 20 dBi, 18 dBd. So that, that's the same thing. And basically, it's a waveguide transmission with a bit of a flared mouth. Uh, and it's quite a novel approach to perhaps making a 13 centimetre uh, or a 9 centimetre antenna. Um, so anybody who's interested in uh, Yagi type antennas at, um, at microwave frequencies, uh, hopefully you've got a few ideas uh, uh, there. 
fish antennas. Um, basically, once we get above 4.4 gigahertz, most people, you know, by then you stop using Yagis and you're definitely into using dish antennas. And we've already seen that this dish uh, with the appropriate feed could be used from 23 centimetres all the way up to uh, 24 gigahertz. Um, there is a little bit of a trade-off though. If you go too big a size in dish um, and you have too much gain, then the, the actual beam width gets very small. Um, we mentioned that big dish that uh, Brian NNS uh, is using, 3.7 meter uh, diameter dish. Um, on 24 gigahertz, it's, it's a fraction of a degree uh, is the beam width. In fact, when the signal hits the moon, it only illuminates a tiny dot on the moon. <laughs> to give you some idea of how narrow the beam is. In fact, there we are, that's the same, uh, the same dish that we're talking about. Um, uh, a team of people there helping Brian to, um, uh, to get his dish operational. Um, one thing about big dishes like that, um, uh, very often they do come up for, for free. Uh, there's been several around this year. In fact, there was an, an identical one to this offered just a few weeks ago. Uh, the downside is, have you got space for it? Um, would you know what to do with it if you got it? Because uh, it is quite a heavy thing. Uh, it's not a sectional dish. Um, but they often go for scrap value or, 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 or free. Um, so anybody who wanted a big dish and wanted to have a go perhaps eventually at something like EME, uh, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Uh, that's one of my other older dishes, um, uh, 24 gigahertz, and that's a 45 centimeter dish, and that is one that we, um, it's a solid focal plane dish. Um, this has got an arrangement where the transverser sits at the back of the dish, and um, the signal comes along the waveguide, hits this kind of reflector arrangement at the end of the waveguide, which directs it to, uh, to the dish. Um, quite, uh, quite useful, and it, that sort of dish is, uh, often quite easy to mount. As you've seen here um, with the um, uh, offset dish, there's a little bit more thought has to be given with the offset dish, whereas a focal plane dish, um, you can have the transfer to sat right behind the dish and uh, often quite easy to uh, arrangement to go. Uh, there's a, an offset dish. Um, the good thing about offset dishes is, well, they're ridiculously cheap and plentiful. Um, that one, I think, came from Lidl uh, and was bought new. I think it was about £12. That one came out of a skip. And certainly the, um, the current one that I use at home, that was another uh, one that was rescued from a skip. Um, uh, they don't have to, uh, don't cost a lot of money. It is worth it, I suppose, if you uh, are planning to use certainly the higher uh, frequency bands, um, uh, 5.6, uh, uh, 3 centimetres, 24 gigahertz, to get one that has a good profile. And I think this one uh, that's actually pictured here um, has got a very uh, accurate profile. This one from Lidl, if you look at the edges of, of it here, it's only a, a, a pressed steel thing, and you can actually see it starts to roll off a little bit at the edges. So it's not a, an absolutely accurate profile, whereas something like that, um, which was made, I think, by Channel Master or the old Andrews Company, um, has got a very accurate profile. Certainly will work all the way up to 24 gigahertz without any problems. Um, you notice this one's got uh, quite a nice um, little pyramidal uh, feed. Uh, these pyramid feeds are quite, uh, quite easy to get going uh, for, uh, for dishes. Yeah, th this I've got a slide coming up uh, that shows you um, uh, the relationship between gain and the beam width, which is quite, uh, quite worth looking at. Uh, the other thing I would mention here is um, uh, if you're interested in the gain of a dish or, or possibly how, uh, how it will work and so on, um, VK3UM, VK3 Uncle Mike, um, you can download software. I mean, it was intended for EME use, but it, it surprisingly works right down and it's, it's quite useful. You can have a play with it. I've got one, I think, uh, loaded up on possibly on one of my other computers that we can have a look at, and you can work out a lot of the uh, uh, useful parameters. So VK3UM, uh, you download it off the internet, uh, and it will help you to work out the dish gain and um, you know, your system as well. well. We'll talk about systems a, a little bit later. Yeah, did you have a question on this?
be wary that they're dropping seats or, yeah. or, or whatever, because obviously that will affect the total. That's right, yeah. Obviously, they need to. Not, not to be uh, surprisingly, though, uh, um, uh, on the point of how, how bad can a dish be before uh, um, uh, it doesn't work? Uh, well, I was out portable on one occasion uh, over on the other side of the Peak District, and I just arrived. I set up my dish. Um, I had um, a chap on the other end, uh, G4BRK, uh, a chap called Neil, uh, Neil Whiting, and I just started to make the contact when there was a huge gust of wind and the tripod and all the stuff went over on the floor and I leapt up to it and I pulled the thing back up and when I looked at the dish it was like a pretzel, it was literally bent over. But I was able to carry on and make the contact because in actual fact we only lost 3 dB of the signal uh, with it bent like a pretzel. So uh, you know, they have to be quite a long way um, uh, distorted. Although what uh, Andy is saying, obviously if you're looking for a dish you want to get one that's going to be uh, uh, quite useful. Okay, uh, uh, this, this perhaps illuminates what I was mentioning about um, you can actually get away with a 60 centimetre dish and use it at every frequency from uh, 23 sems up to, uh, uh, up to the higher microwave bands. If you look here, um, a two foot dish, uh, well two foot 60 centimetres roughly, um, how much gain would it have? Uh, well, 15. Uh, now this is a classic one where Despite the fact that this was meant to be a technical manual, it doesn't tell you whether it's DBI or DBD. In actual fact, as far as I understand it, this should be DBI. So it's reference to isotropic um, uh, uh, radiators, if you like. Uh, so 15 DBI gain um, at 23 centimetres. That equa equates to about 13 DBD. So it's quite low as a gain for 23 centimetres, but there is gain there. Um, and it would have a beam width of about perhaps 27 degrees. So at 23 centimetres, a dish like that would have a, a, a beam width of uh, 27 degrees. But you can see it comes right up all the bands. Uh, at 13 centimetres, its gain's gone up to about 20 dBi or 18 dBd or thereabouts. But now the beam's coming narrower, uh, 15 degrees or so. Uh, you could use the same one at uh, nine centimeters and then it would have a gain of um, where are we it would have a gain of about 26 or 27 uh, uh, dbi so not a tough loss for dbd uh, but the beam width would now have, uh, have altered to something like seven degrees and you can use it at 10 10 gigahertz um, there we are 10 gig and uh, at 10 gigahertz it's got very high gain obviously we've mentioned uh, about 30 uh, say 33 dBi, 31 dBd, um, but the beam width is now down to about 3 degrees. And you could use it even at 24 gigahertz where it's got very high gain. The only problem there is that now the beam width on something like that at 24 gigahertz is 1.5 degrees, and that does take a lot of pointing. But you could use a single reflector like that all the way up through the microwave bands. Okay, um, I've said this a dish kind of reflector here. Um, you could use it on all, all bands um, because the dish is, it, it works irrespective of frequencies within a certain uh, 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 range, if you like. The thing that you would have to change, though, is the feed arrangement. And there are lots of different ways that you could feed uh, um, a dish. Uh, anybody who's really interested in feeding dish antennas, then I would recommend that you, you check uh, out Paul Wade. Um, Whiskey One Golf Hotel Zulu, uh, W1 Gigahertz. Um, Paul Wade, uh, he's got an excellent online antenna uh, handbook, if you like, and it goes through all, all sorts of things to do with all kinds of antennas, especially uh, uh, dish antennas and microwave antennas. Um, basically, we can think about these sort of things. These are the common ones that, as microwavers, most of us are using. We're using either a conical horn, a pyramidal horn, uh, a dipole and splash plate. Uh, Peter already showed you the log periodic, those little printed circuit ones. Uh, you get some even easier ones, a coffee can feed or a penny feed. Um, very simple arrangement. Or a slightly more sophisticated one is this VE4MA. Um, there we are. That's um, 
the conical horn, and uh, we're talking about the usefulness of uh, places like B&Q, that's just made out of plumbing uh, uh, components. In fact, I met, I met somebody today and they just already said that they've brought along uh, their version of this uh, to actually check on the antenna test range. Uh, various Yorkshire reducers and things. Um, and in actual fact, that will give you, if you make it to the right dimensions, and there, there are various sets of information about this floating around, uh, it will give you a very good uh, feed for a dish like this. Most of these satellite dishes, by the way, um, have what's called an FD ratio, uh, focus to the diameter um, of 0.5 or 0.6, and that kind of feed is actually optimised for these sort of antennas. Um, you could also make horns from uh, um, or, or an old satellite block. Um, this is one, in fact, I brought it along. Um, yeah, where is it? There we are. In fact, I found two of them. Um, they actually, they look like they're made from uh, uh, a cast, from the weight, they feel like they're cast uh, steel, possibly. Um, if you look inside, I'm taking the cover off one of them, uh, that's this, it's actually called a chaparral arrangement uh, inside with these ridged uh, rings. Um, the intended frequency is from about 10.6 up to about 11.5 gigahertz. Um, but in actual fact, they're so close to the diameter three centimetre band that you can make quite a good feed. Uh, and if you get a dish and it comes with uh, a, a horn like this, the horn is usually optimised for the dish. Um, so, well, it's very simple. This one's just been crudely cut. In fact, they've both been crudely cut off. But if you notice the inside uh, diameter here, it exactly matches um, 22 millimetre uh, copper water pipe uh, and you can use that and you can transition it to uh, um, either a square or a round wave guide flange to couple into your system. Um, how would I do that? Well, I've already started here. I filed off a ridge and basically I would square the end off on this, uh, get a piece of pipe that fits over your, um, uh, your 22 millimetre water pipe and basically I'd glue that on there and just butt joint it. And in fact, um, this one... This antenna here that I found, I found it in the skip. You can see I've done exactly that. Um, I made it, knocked it up in the lunchtime uh, to use out portable. My transverter sits onto here. I just use that to fasten on there. Virtually no loss in the, um, in the feed. Um, that is more or less matched to this antenna. Uh, a bit of arrow bite and a bit of uh, uh, gubbins and that, uh, it works well. Um, that's another one that we can stick perhaps on the antenna test range tomorrow. Yeah. Oops, not fastened in. So that's um, the virtually no, a no cost three centimeter antenna and feed. Um, 22 millimeter uh, copper wave guide plumbing uh, bits and um, it's just a modified TV LM block uh, feed horn. You just have to be careful because uh, in fact we can take it off the stand um, it's not fastened to the stand, but uh, you can have a look at that. So things don't have to cost a lot of money. Um, a pyramidal horn, uh, this, this one that's pictured here has actually got an N-type connector and it was intended for six, uh, six centimetres. And you can see that's another homemade one. Um, that is made out of um, uh, sheet um, uh, copper type material, uh, just soldered up. If you're going to solder things, um, it is worth trying to keep solder out of the waveguide. Microwaves, uh, uh, lead acts um, and solder acts like an absorber, really. So you try to keep um, uh, stuff like that out of the waveguide. Uh, that's, that's another little pyramidal horn. In fact, um, I think Brian has got some kits of these. So if anybody's wanting to make up an arrangement like this, um, the Microwave Club is going to make some of these and sell them at, I think, £25. That, includes all the machining that you have to uh, uh, solder the um, uh, little PCB horn. And most of us, when we make these, we actually glue the PCB uh, to the microwave guide. And then this one, um, I've just put a piece of um, some car body filler and it would be flattened down to actually, uh, it just makes it really quite robust. That's actually quite a robust arrangement now. Uh, and the other day, whilst I was looking at that, I thought, well, could get even simpler because I know there's, there's somebody in the room here uh, um, who, who have difficulty getting hold of some pieces of waveguide. 
uh, and it was holding him up from making his system. Well, I made a little feed horn and a transition just out of the printed circuit board. I've not checked it yet, um, but hopefully it shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have uh, many losses. So you don't even need waveguide. The only thing that you need there is an SMA connector. Um, and again, that might, I'll, I'll try, check that out and see whether it proves to be effective, but certainly quite a cheap way. Uh, that's the arrangement that um, I've got here. Um, that's what the club is actually doing as a bit of a kit. So if anybody's really stuck, um, you could get one of those from uh, the club. Uh, I think it's Brian, uh, G4NNS, who's got somebody who can do the machine in there. So if you want one that's properly machined, um, we'll sort you out with that. Uh, log periodic feeds. I use one of these at six centimeters um, for quite a while with a dish like this, and it was very effective. Um, I used it just on a single band rather than using it as a multi-band feed. Um, it's got a gain of about 6 dBd just in the little log periodic. Um, but as Peter says, don't put a lot of power through these. But then we've already said most of us are only using perhaps uh, you know, a few watts. Uh, with one of these, a dish like this uh, from the North Yorkshire Moors with a basic transverter with 200 uh, milliwatts output, I was easily able to work down to uh, the south coast on 6 centimetres. So that's 200 milliwatts a little printed circuit board feed and a, a basic transverse and a 60 centimetre dish. And you could work 300 kilometres with, with no particular problems. Um, that's a dipole and a splash plate uh, reflector. Again, made out of uh, uh, readily accessible bits and pieces. So what's going on here? Uh, well, there's an end type um, connector at the back there, an end type socket, a piece of brass sheet, um, uh, I was lucky at the time, I worked at Sheffield University uh, as a technician, and I was able to cut that out on some of the machinery there. Basically, the inner of the end type is connected to uh, a piece of uh, hollow tube about a quarter of an inch uh, diameter. That connects onto a copper uh, one side of the dipole. Uh, the other element, that's on a slightly wider piece of copper tubing. And then this thing on the outer side here, uh, was a piece of brass tubing uh, that just forms a coaxial ballon uh, to make sure that the, the two dipoles uh, are, are actually balanced, if you like. It's another way of going from uh, unbalanced coax to, uh, to a balanced coaxial uh, uh, or balanced feed. Uh, and it's made out of simple things. Using that with a dish like this on 23 centimetres, when I first got going on, on 23 cents, um, I was dead lucky, in fact, I was ridiculously lucky. I, I got a dish like that, which I used for three centimeters from home. Uh, I'd made a microwave transverter for 23 cents. I uh, just managed to get a, a little power amplifier going and the band opened up and I thought, well, how can I, I haven't got an area, what can I do? Um, and I, I remember I'd, have, I'd made this little uh, uh, dipole and splash plate. And all I did is I took my three centimeter feed off put that dipole and splash plate in its place, and I found I was working uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, Switzerland and uh, Germany, and that is just with um, 13 dBd of, of antenna gain. So you can use it. Uh, again, another simple feed, uh, a coffee can. Uh, the Americans uh, refer to them as coffee cans. In, in Britain, it's more likely to be a soup can. Uh, this one is for 3.4 uh, gigahertz. Um, very simple, it's just a, an empty can. It's got an, an SMA soldered on one side and just as a bit of sophistication, we have a brass uh, matching screw opposite it just so that you can actually uh, provide a slightly better match. But how much more simple can it get? And the other thing is, anybody thinking about 3.4 gigahertz, how about this for an easy and cheap way? You could use a soup can like that, fastened to the end of a boom. Uh, use some of those um, uh, standoff insulators uh, with some uh, uh, little elements on, and you've made yourself, in effect, a hybrid-type Yagi, similar to the one that we passed around with the waveguide feed. So I'll be interested to see if anybody makes anything like that. Uh, there you are. That's the same arrangement, but this time it's not got the, uh, um, the matching on the other side. You can see that the probe of the SMA has actually been lengthened slightly. Uh, penny feed, um, in the days of wideband FM, 
one of the common dishes that used to be uh, available was one that was supplied by Practical Wireless. Um, they, they were quite a deep dish, and most people used to uh, just poke a piece of waveguide through them, um, and the easiest way to, uh, to find an effective feed was used to use a, literally a penny um, or, or a small copper disc. There were some slots cut into the back of the waveguide, and that provided quite an effective uh, feed arrangement for these relatively deep dishes. Um, so uh, if you've got, uh, we're talking about the um, uh, FD ratio, if you, if you end up buying a, uh, a dish and it's got a relatively deep um, uh, profile, uh, around 0.3 or smaller, uh, then this kind of feed is quite useful. Um, VE4MA, uh, that's another uh, method of feeding. If you look at this closely, it's very similar to the soup can feed. Uh, we've basically got a circular waveguide feed, but then just to improve the matching, there's got this arrangement on it. And you can make those uh, relatively easy. Uh, PCB material and bits of uh, sheet uh, copper. Uh, the good news about that is you can slide that uh, collar arrangement backwards and forwards, and you can match it to quite a wide uh, range of uh, uh, dish FD ratios. It's, it's just clamped to, clamped to that circular. Yeah, you can move it up and down. Probably the thing to do is if you're going to use it with one dish is once you've found the best position, fix it permanently in that position. But some people have them sliding. Um, I don't think um, we really need to say a lot about um, finding the focus of the dish. Occasionally people buy dishes and it's not got the, the arm on it and, and you can't really tell where the feed is. Uh, there are different ways that you can do it. Um, there is a formula, and that formula is in uh, many of these books. So if you've not got a mounting arm and you buy an unusual looking dish, uh, there are other ways though that you can do it. One is to actually uh, uh, do it optically by putting strips of uh, aluminium foil on and actually holding a piece of card in front, and you can actually see where the, uh, the focal point is. Um, so that is a, a way of doing it. And remember that if you use one of these uh, offset dishes, normally it's tilted over. It looks, um, when you first come to microwaves, it looks very wrong because it's tilted over. But if you think that most satellite dishes are in, intended to look up at the sky, that is why when they're on the side of your house, they're vertical. Uh, we're not interested in looking up at the sky. We want to generally look towards the horizon. So they're tilted over at typically 25 to 27 degrees, something like that. Uh, Peter mentioned about these fly swatter arrangement antennas, and this is a practical one. Uh, there was a guy who uh, lived in South Wales in a valley, and he very effectively used this arrangement. Uh, it's sometimes called a periscope antenna, where you've got all the bits accessible at the bottom, so the transverse is in that box and a little dish, and it just sends it up to a flat plate, and then that sends the signal out. He's also got um, uh, an actuator uh, arm that slides that uh, reflector up and down, and you can actually alter the angle of the beam that it sends out with that. So quite a useful arrangement. You can actually see there there's a, a satellite um, uh, actuator arm that shoves the uh, reflector backwards and forward. So uh, fly swatter antennas, that might be a useful way. You, you can probably then, Peter mentioned about uh, uh, having things accessible for maintenance. You could have that quite low down and you know the bit at the top really uh, uh, is not very uh, uh, delicate. Uh, horn antennas, um, those are really quite useful. We can either use them as a feed arrangement or you could use it as a, an antenna in its own right. And horns have got a few interesting properties. Uh, one is that they're fairly easy to construct. You can either make them out of sheet material and fold it and bend it and solder it or you could use something like printed circuit board stuff and solder that up. Very easy, that will give you a really lightweight um, uh, feed. In fact, the difference between the, the machined one and this one is, is quite noticeable. Uh, so you could make something quite big out of printed circuit board and it would still be quite light. Um, the other good thing about horns is generally um, they present a very good match to, uh, to the rest of your equipment. In other words, um, um, you know, there's no sort of complicated business. They usually present quite a good match. And you can get all the design data uh, out of books like the um, Microwave Handbook. So, 
here you are, let's imagine that you've built all this equipment. How do you know if it's working properly? Uh, because um, certainly when I got going with microwaves, you know, how, how do you know that it's all working properly? Well, if it's an antenna and a, a feed system, one thing that you can do is bring it along to uh, a round table meeting like this. And I think it's tomorrow we'll have an antenna test range and we'll be able to check a number of antennas to make sure that they're working properly and work out on, uh, the gain. Um, how else might you do it? Well, we can use directional couplers. Um, they are limited in, in one sense because the directional coupler itself will uh, not perhaps present a perfect match. Um, uh, and basically, that will limit your um, uh, readings. But it should stop you from having any gross errors. And if you look here, um, this is the one I use for measurements on, uh, on three centimeters. It's a 20 uh, dB coupler. Um, you can use it for doing things like SWR and so on. And you can also use it um, if, if, say, you've got a lot of power, you can use a directional coupler um, with a low power power meter. Uh, my power meter, uh, even with its attachments, only goes up to uh, uh, about 10 watts. Uh, if I use any more than that, you'd damage the power meter. Um, so uh, I've been testing recently uh, a 13 centimeter power amplifier that produces 250 watts. Um, how, do, how could I measure the power? Well, I made up this thing. Um, basically, a couple of bits of coax. Uh, I filed two little grooves in so that um, uh, the inner of one could see the inner of the other, soldered it all together. And with that, I was able to measure 200 watts of, uh, or in excess of 200 watts from this 30, 13 centimeter power amplifier with my um, power meter that only really is intended to read up to about uh, uh, 100 milliwatts. It's, uh, uh, and that's one way around it. So you can do that. Uh, another way that you can do things is to, um, uh, especially people who are into EME, uh, they, they're always going on about um, the sun noise and, and cold sky and warm ground. And the actual fact, it's quite easy to do that. Um, uh, I was quite interested at one point in, in finding out um, whether I could actually see any sun noise on my 10 gig system. And I, I very quickly, well you can see there's no, nothing very sophisticated, this is all dangling in the air. Um, Poked that into the audio output from my uh, 817 and uh, I pointed it first of all just up at the sky and I set it for the mid reading here and then I moved it so that it was pointing at the sun. And woo, meter went right over. And then by uh, putting in, in place um, a series of uh, calibrated attenuators, I could work out how much uh, excess noise I could see when it was pointed at the, uh, the sun. So very simple, all, all that is, is a meter. Um, this is called out of a, uh, a radio, it's just an audio transformer, and there's a diode and a capacitor. And that's really all that is. Uh, and this is actually quite, I found other uses for it. It's quite useful when you're out and you want to uh, peak your antenna on a, uh, another station. If they send you a plain carrier, uh, you can plug that in. And basically, you just keep adjusting this to the maximum deflection. And then the, the antenna is aligned uh, on the other station there. So it doesn't have to be excessively complicated. Uh, there you are, I'd even press my uh, wife in to uh, uh, drag her off from doing the gardening. And I was checking out this antenna. Uh, at the moment, this antenna, it's actually pointing up at the cold sky. You can see that normally would be horizontal uh, if it was working propo. Um, a, a homemade um, transition, just like the one that you've seen around there. Um, and yeah, I could see the, um, I could see moon noise and sun noise uh, with this arrangement. Um, uh, I, I've actually found it more useful to use the cold sky and what's called the warm ground. Um, uh, it's sometimes referred to as a Y factor method. And again, there are details of exactly how to do that in the microwave handbook. The other thing is um, uh, there's some very useful software in, in one of the Radcoms um, uh, a year or so ago. Uh, there was a, a chap called G8KBB and he, he had a, an article about measuring noise. Um, and to go with his um, uh, noise measuring equipment, he had some software. But the software is actually very flexible, or I found it very flexible. And you can actually um, use his software 
to do, it auto, up, virtually automates the system for you. Um, you set the software running uh, on your computer, everything connected together, point your antenna at a, a region of cold sky, and then just bring it round. So in my case, I pointed it at the wall behind where my wife stood, and you see a change in uh, uh, the amount of noise that you're receiving. And, and basically, uh, G8KBB software will do this automatically for you. Okay, so uh, that's it, really. It's up to you now. Microwave antennas aren't difficult. Um, in fact, they can be very cheap and easy. Uh, a lot of mine are salvaged from ships. And hopefully, um, you've got a few ideas, uh, perhaps that you've not thought about before, to actually uh, help you to get started and have a go. Okay, thanks very much, people. Thank <laughs> you.